Our first roll up the sleeves nugget is going to focus more in depth on the various roles that are part of every scrum project. And we oriented you to these roles in the introduction. We're going to spend much more detail in this nugget on them. And we're going to have an independent nugget focused on the Scrum Master itself, since this is a Scrum Master preparatory series. So in this nugget, we will give you a high level overview of what the roles and responsibilities of a Scrum Master are, recognizing that we have another detailed nugget with the focus exclusively on the Scrum Master. So we will go through the Scrum Master with somewhat high level but we will provide a definitive statement of what the product owner does on the project. We will talk in a great deal of detail about the project team itself, the Scrum team, and we'll talk about those other roles that are important as part of a Scrum development, such as the subject matter experts, the all important business owner who has the resources, the dollars, the authority to approve the project, and finally, we'll spend some time talking about how we can best implement, support, encourage the organization to work effectively with Scrum and to accept Scrum as part of a proven process for delivering high quality software in our organization. But first, let's focus on, at a high level, what the Scrum Master does. So at a high level, the Scrum Master in my humble opinion, the Scrum Master's main job is to remove any and all roadblocks to facilitate the team. So if the team has a roadblock that the, the SMEs are not being responsive, if the business, or sorry, if the project has a roadblock that the technology they need is not available, if the team has a roadblock that their current PCs are inadequate to support the development requirements for the project, it's the Scrum Master's responsibility to remove those roadblocks. In a lot of instances, the Scrum Master is going to be the facilitator working with organizational management, working with the product owner, working with IT management, working with security management, working with whoever has the ability to actually remove the roadblocks. So when I say the Scrum Master's job is to remove the roadblocks, in a lot of instances, I don't believe the Scrum Master, him, him or herself, can actually remove the roadblocks, but the Scrum Master is going to facilitation, facilitate the removal of the roadblocks. Find the person in the organization who can remove the impediments to the team's forward progress. And the second job for the Scrum Master is to ensure Scrum principles are applied. Now, in a purest sense, the Scrum Master's main job is to ensure that Scrum principles are applied. The Scrum Master should be a guru. The Scrum Master should be an expert in everything Scrum. Hence, the Scrum Master should be certified as a Scrum Master, not simply someone who has picked up a book and said, oh, this Scrum stuff sounds really interesting. I think I will be the Scrum Master and lead my organization into Scrum development. Scrum Mastering is a lot of work and we need to be recognized experts. We need to be truly proficient in the principles of, in the application of, in the delivery of Scrum approaches throughout your organization. And as a Scrum Master, we need to ensure that the Scrum principles are being applied within reason. One of the things we're going to talk about throughout this Nugget series is there are very few rules for Scrum we can be adaptive, we can be innovative, we can have process improvement throughout. And as part of all of those adjectives, we may adjust, we may do some flexibility in the Scrum process, but there are certain Scrum principles that I would suggest 
and Scrum in general suggests are absolutely mandatory. The daily Scrum, do not, do not stop doing your daily Scrum, no matter how much pushback you may get from the team or how much pushback you may get from the business that says, we don't have time to spend 15 minutes a day. Ensure that the daily Scrum takes place. Ensure that the Scrum planning session takes place and that the Scrum planning session does exactly what it is going to do. So as we go through this series, I will highlight certain Scrum principles that I believe and most Scrum supporters believe are absolutely mandatory. And that's what the Scrum Master is responsible for, is ensuring those mandatory principles are applied. Over and above that, being a Scrum Master is, I'm going to say, a thankless job. And I, and I don't mean that in a negative sense because actually being a Scrum Master is a very enriching, rewarding job. But I say it's a, a, a thankless job because the Scrum Master has no managerial authority. The Scrum Master is not responsible for delivering the, the project, the Scrum, the iteration, the sprint. The Scrum Master has no direct managerial authority over the team. The team is a self-managing group as we'll discuss later in this nugget when we discuss the, the roles and responsibilities of the team. And this is a key concept that it's critical that everyone in the organization understands. The Scrum Master has no managerial authority. The Scrum Master removes the roadblocks. The Scrum Master ensures that we're applying Scrum principles. The Scrum Master is not is not a project manager. The Scrum Master is the facilitator to ensure the team can work effectively in a Scrum fashion. And that's what the Scrum Master does. Scrum Mastering may not be a full-time position. The Scrum Master may also be a working team member. So when I say Scrum Master is not a full-time position, and I definitely tagged on the sometimes over there, if your organization is new in the rollout of, in the adaption of, in the implementation of Scrum principles, then I would say being a Scrum Master is absolutely a full-time position. There's going to be a lot of roadblocks. There's going to be a lot of coaching. There's going to be a lot of supporting. There's going to be a lot of encouragement. There's going to be a lot of enforcing of the Scrum principles in a new implementation adaptation of Scrum. If on the other hand, your organization has been using Scrum principles for a number of years, if your team are all experienced Scrum team members, then yes, being a Scrum master may not be a full-time position. There's not a lot of enforcing of the principles and the roadblocks are far less evident in your organization because your organization is used to being in a scrum fashion. So yes, being a scrum master may not be a full-time position, but at least initially, I would expect your organization, I would expect you to be prepared to be full-time scrum master for the, I would say for f the first year or so, and be prepared to move back to full-time position as you bring in new team members who are not scrum literate, or as you begin to develop software for new parts of the organization that are not Scrum literate. Most books on most Scrum specialists would say the product owner is the most important position. Slash person. On a Scrum project. As I said in the introduction, I'm taking a little bit of liberty in this Nugget series as our focus is on preparing to be a Scrum Master. I'm taking a little bit of liberty in suggesting that the Scrum Master, I believe, is on par with the product owner as a most important person on a Scrum project, simply because the Scrum Master is going to ensure the project adheres to Scrum principles and the Scrum Master would take on, would challenge the product owner if the product owner begins to act in a non-Scrum fashion. So what does a product owner do to be a Scrum facilitator? 
the product owner is going to do these five things. The product owner absolutely owns the product vision. The product owner understands the what the business wants. The product owner will understand what the business wants and will agree to changes in the vision. As we'll discuss in a couple of nuggets time when we start to talk about the scrum rituals and the development of the product vision with the business owner. So the product owner does not develop the vision alone. The product owner is going to develop the product vision with the business owner. But once the product vision is created, the product owner owns the product vision and therefore needs to absolutely understand exactly what it is that the business wants and agrees to changes in the vision as a result of changing business environment as a as a result of changing organizational structures as a result of any and all changes associated with the evolution of our understanding of the project and our evolution of the expectation of how the product is going to be delivered into the organization. And although I didn't spell it out on my slide, the product owner needs to demonstrate, needs to vocalize, needs to show, and needs to document the product vision. way back a long time ago when I was doing some project management training. So this is traditional project management training, not scrum training, but somebody used the term, excuse me for advocating my mandate. That was appropriate 20 years ago when I was doing project management training. Yes, I am that old. That is also very appropriate for the product owner. Excuse me for advocating my mandate. The product owner owns that product vision. They need to demonstrate, they need to vocalize, they need to show, they need to document, they need to make the product vision visible and understandable. And understood by the team. The product vision should be short Again, if you, if you look at uh, the, what, what are the characteristics of a good vision statement for an organization, more or less the same characteristics of what is a good vision statement for a product applies. It should be short, it should be complete, it should be visible, it should be posted in the work area so that everybody involved with the project understands can vocalize, can demonstrate, can act within, can support the product vision. Excuse me for advocating my mandate. With the product vision well defined and understood, the product owner is the person who identifies the work for the team, i.e. creates the stories. And I know we haven't really talked about what a user story is yet in this Nugget series. Again, that's coming in a, in a future Nugget. But the user stories document the what is required. So the user stories break the product vision down into a number of more manageable pieces. And again, typically at this level, these were going to be what we would call epics. And then the epics break down into smaller epics and the smaller epics will break down into user stories where the user stories are the defined unit of work that the team is going to take on. The product owner owns each and every one of these user stories, which is the documentation of what is going to be delivered by the team. And the product owner prioritizes. 
the user stories. Yes, I understand there are 36 user stories in the backlog, but these five are the most important user stories to me. These five are the user stories I want you to, to complete in the next sprint. And really, that's what we're talking about when we say manages the backlog. Takes the user stories, prioritizes them, defines what's in a sprint, and then approves the sprint. And the product owner is going to approve the sprint in two ways. Number one, the approval is what is in the sprint. I.e. selects the five next most important stories. Assigns those stories to the sprint works with the team to ensure the stories are appropriately satisfied in the sprint and reviews and approves the work in the sprint and saying yes the code written the documentation created the processes defined in this sprint absolutely satisfy what it is i want it done in those five stories yes Team, you've done the work that I wanted done in the sprint. I declare this sprint a success. I declare this sprint closed. And most importantly for our product owner, the product owner has to be available to the team. Ideally, the product owner sits with the team. Ideally, the product owner's workspace is in the same workspace as our Scrum team. Often that's not possible because the product owner is not 100% dedicated to the project. But where possible, having the co product owner co-located is perfect. But as a minimum, the product owner needs to be available to the team three to four hours a day. And again, the product owner availability to the team has to be in close proximity to the team. Saying the product owner is available, oh, I'm just an email or a phone call away, doesn't work. If the team member picks up a user story and says, this isn't really clear to me. If the, the team member can look at the user story and say, this isn't clear to me, and then look across their workspace and say, oh, there's the product owner sitting right there. I'm going to pull up my chair and talk to him or her. That's far more effective than the team member saying, oh, this isn't clear to me. I'll set it aside at the corner of my desk until the product owner shows up. Or I'll go to my calendar and I'll book a formal meeting to ask the product owner to come down and discuss it with me. We don't want our scrum working that way. We want the product owner absolutely physically available to the team ideally in exactly the same workspace. The product owner is one of, in a lot of instances, people say the most important member of the project itself, of the Scrum engagement, because they own the, the vision, they identify the work, and they do the approval of the work. And our Scrum team does all the work. The product owner identifies the stories and assigns the stories to the sprint. The team then picks up the story and does anything and everything required to complete to satisfy the story. So that means the team does the analysis, the hour or two of analysis to better understand the ask on the story. The team does the design to take the ask and, and put it into a format that we can code it. The team does the development. The team does the testing. The team does the documentation. The team does, the team does, the team does. Does that mean to be a Scrum team member? Each and every team member has to be able to do all of the above. The answer is ideally yes, but in reality, in practicality, the answer is typically never. It is a very rare and precious Scrum team member who can do adequate analysis, design, development, testing 
documentation, etc., etc., it is the rare team member that can pick up a story and individually complete everything required to satisfy the story. But the team combined, so we have Fred and we have Betty and we have Sally and we have dot 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 on our project team. Fred may be a senior resource and does a lot of analysis and design and dabbles in development. Betty is less senior, does a lot of design, and is a really strong senior developer. And Sally is just cutting her teeth as, a, as a, a, an IT person and is primarily a developer and a tester. So therefore, in all likelihood, when the team picks up a story, the team may ask Fred to do the original analysis on a complex story, or the team may say, Betty, this one doesn't look too complicated. Do you want to give this one a try? Fred will do his work, spend the hour, have the discussion with the product owner, confirm the work, and then Fred will have a brief discussion with Betty or Sally saying, here is the work required. Here is the more details associated with the story. Betty or Sally, why don't you go ahead and do the design and the development, and I'll check back in with you partway through the development to make sure that you're still on track. Recognizing that all of this has taken place in hours, not days, weeks, or months. And when Sally is all done the development, Sally may choose to do the testing herself, or Sally may choose to say, you know what, Ralph, actually would be better to test this because this integrates directly with another story that Ralph is working on. So why don't we let Ralph do it? The key is the team does all of the above. The team may choose to divvy up, to allocate the pieces of work across the skills of the team. The team is accountable to each other and the team has the total authority on how the work gets done. Again, Fred may do a piece of it, Betty may do a piece of it, Sally may do a piece of it, we may bring in Ralph, we may bring in whatever, but the team is accountable. The team makes the decision. The team decides which pieces of analysis and design and development and testing and so on that is going to be done by which team members. The team decides whether they're going to do pair programming. The team decides how each and every story is going to be taken from picking it up off the backlog, off the sprint plan, to absolute total satisfaction. The team is a self-managing, self-organizing, self-accounting organization. And that is an absolute critical principle of Scrum. When I said I'm going to point out the principles of Scrum that absolutely cannot be sl slipped and slided and, and, and deferred, a 100% self-organizing team is critical to Scrum because as soon as you don't have a 100% self-organizing team, you have a single person with power and authority to do work assignment. And that is non-Scrum. What is a good team size? Scrum teams are typically smallish. An ideal team size, most people will suggest, is five to seven people. Scrum teams can be smaller, but if the team gets smaller, recognizing that we have all of these skills that have to be satisfied with a small two to three person team, we're stretching our gene pool fairly tight, and therefore the selection of a two to three person team that has the skills to do all of this is much harder to do. But as you increase the size of the gene pool, you have more people and you can accept that sac the fact that Sally is a junior resource and really only is a developer and a tester. It makes the allocation and the authority to do the work easier. If you go much beyond seven, you get into more discussions and it becomes harder to self-manage. I've, I've seen it written that the ideal team size is a two, per, uh, two pizza team. 
So if you're going to have a team lunch, if you're going to have a team supper, if you're going to bring in a pizza as part of your Scrum retrospective, ideally you should not have to bring in more than two pizzas to feed the entire team. So if you have some really heavy eaters, your team size has to be small. No. But again, just as, as a very quick rule of thumb, a, an ideal scrum team should be a team that can be easily organized, managed, and fed. If we continue on that principle, um, again, most people will, will agree that an ideal scrum team is five to seven people, gives you enough resources with a diverse enough skill set that ensures we have skills to do all of the above. And a key concept of the Scrum team, it includes the Scrum master and it includes the product owner with one minor exception. The product owner is part of the team, but the product owner really has no authority on the how. The product owner has accountability in, the, in terms of defining and refining and improving and validating the story but the product owner has no authority on the how unless the product owner happens to be this very rare business person who is also a competent Java developer who actually is going to be generating code. But my expectation is, is that product owner isn't that competent Java developer, so therefore the product owner has no authority on the how. But the Scrum Master is absolutely part of the team, part of the accountability, and the total authority to each other does not have overall authority but is part of the joint authority and depending on whether it's a part-time PM or part-time PM there we go there's a Freudian slip part-time scrum master may be a developer may be a tester so therefore again is absolutely an integral part of the scrum team Subject matter experts are not part of the team. They will supplement the business owners or the product owners business knowledge, but they are not part of the team. They have no project authority. They have no responsibility. They're not part of the team. They are there to supplement the business owners business knowledge as needed and are typically called in by the product owner. So when a team member goes to the product owner and says, I'm working on story 15, it's not clear to me what the expectations of story 15 are. The product owner would have a look at story 15 and says, yep, you know, I wondered those same questions. Let me go get my subject matter expert and we'll have a brief conversation with the subject matter expert and the subject matter expert can absolutely fill us in on the details we're looking for for that story. So they are called in in support of typically called in by the business owner to provide to supplement the business knowledge that the product owner does not need. It's entirely possible we could complete an entire scrum project with no subject matter experts assuming that the product owner's business knowledge is deep enough to answer all of the detailed questions on his or her own. So, critical to support the project, supplementing the team as needed, but they are not part of the project. They do not participate in any of the rituals. They are called in on an as-is, where-is, when-needed basis, and then thanked very politely said you're critical to the project success and go back and do your day job. And I don't mean that in a rude, sarcastic fashion, but people will often try to interject this me's, the subject matter experts, into the overall scrum team, growing our scrum team from 5 to 7 to 10 to 14, and adding extra voices to all of the rituals, which just bogs down and complicates the scrum process. So treat subject matter experts as what they really are. They're supplemental to the business owner and called in on an as-needed basis only. Another very important person to our Scrum project is the business owner, but much like the subject matter expert, the business owner is not part of the team 
and may or may not even ever be seen by the team. The business owner is typically the person that the product owner reports to. The business owner is a, an organizational manager generally, and the product owner would typically be an operational manager who reports to the business owner and a very knowledgeable in the particular business area that the problem that the project is being done for. The business owner is critical to our project because the, the business owner provides all of the resources, i.e. the dollars, the funding, the approval to allocate our team to the project. So the business owner ultimately owns the final product, but the business owner has delegated full responsibility for the product vision to the product owner. So the product owner may meet with the business owner on a very regular basis, but that's outside of our scrum process. The scrum processes do not truly recognize the existence of the business owner. The scrum processes recognizes the existence of the product owner. We work daily, three to four hours a day, hand in hand, coexisting if possible with the product owner. And the product owner has full responsibility for the product vision delegated to them by the business owner. So the product owner cares an awful lot about the business owner. But the project team, the scrum process, really can exist in a vacuum without any true knowledge of the business owner. And again, the rest of the organization is not part of scrum. In this case, I'm saying it's not even part of scrum. It's not just not part of the project team or the scrum team. The rest of the organization is not part of the scrum process itself but I believe warrants a few minutes discussion because the rest of the organization, especially for an organization that's newly implementing, newly embracing, newly supporting Scrum process, is going to have an awful lot of casual onlookers looking for signs of success or maybe looking for signs of failures. The rest of the organization may be supporters, in which case they're looking for signs of success. Make sure you communicate your successes to these supporters so they can be Scrum evangelists and help spread the word of Scrum throughout the organization. Or they may be Scrum opponents looking for any opportunity to say, oh, that's Scrum stuff, it's not to be done. We need to go back to the old ways. We used to do this in the 70s. And looking for any opportunity to sabotage the Scrum process make sure you have appropriate communications in place for the scrum opponents to not give them the opportunity to spread fear and doubt throughout the organization bottom line is the rest of the organization cannot be ignored the scrum master and the product owner need to ensure the scrum process are being appropriately communicated throughout the organization to keep the organization online and supportive of our process and finally, discussion on the rest of the organization. The organization provides the rules, the standards, and the procedures that our Scrum team will adhere to. So again, all standard organizational policies, all standard organizational HR processes, this organization supports core business hours of everyone should be available from 10 to 3. So although we want to say our scrum team is self-organizing, the scrum team does not have the rights to say, well, we're all self-organizing night owls. We really don't want to come into work until 7 p.m. and work our eight-hour days from 7 p.m. onwards into the wee hours of the morning. The scrum team will need to adhere to the standards, the rules, the policies in the organization. We, we have to recognize that we are part of a larger organization and we have to ensure that we're behaving appropriately in this larger organization to ensure that Scrum gets good press. 
This concludes our nugget on Scrum roles. We focused on the Scrum Master, the facilitator slash remover of roadblocks and the enforcer and I'm going to put that in quotation marks of Scrum principles. The Scrum Master is not a project manager or a manager of any form and has no authority. Lots of influence power, but no direct authority. The Scrum Master is key to ensuring Scrum is appropriately applied and that Scrum projects are success in our organization. The next most important, and in a lot of instances people say the most important, is the product owner owns the vision, identifies what the team needs to do, and approves the work. If there is a person with authority, the authority is directly assigned to the business owner, the bi sorry, the product owner. The product owner has the authority to select what needs to be done, and the product owner has the authority to say, yes, the work is done. The work is done by the team, and the team does the analysis, the design, the development, the testing, the documentation, et cetera, et cetera. The Scrum Master and the product owner are part of the team, and the team is self-organizing and self-directing. And that really constitutes the formal roles as defined in Scrum Development Principles. We also talked very quickly about three other key roles that our Scrum project needs to be aware of. We have subject matter experts who supplement the knowledge of the business owner, but they're not part of the overall project team. I keep saying business owner. The supplements the knowledge of the product owner, but they are not part of the formal project team. We have the business owner, who is typically the boss of the product owner. has the resources, the dollars for the project, and is the ultimate of the end results. So a key person related to the project and the vision, but the business owner is not typically actively involved in the project in the scrum processes itself. And finally, we had a very brief discussion of the rest of, or, rest of the organization that we need to keep in the loop. We need to be promoting Scrum throughout the organization to ensure that Scrum is successfully adapted in our organization. This concludes our nugget on Scrum Roles. I hope this module has been informative for you, and thank you very much for viewing.